welcome to another Behind the Lens. I am film critic Debbie Elias, creator and host of Behind the Lens. And you can find my movie reviews and interviews 24-7 in print and online around the globe. But every Monday, you'll find me right here on AdrenalineRadio.com. And because our beloved station owner, Nick Federoff, loves to play with toys, also streaming on the AdrenalineRadio.com Facebook page. So, tune in, log on. Here we are. Uh, and can't believe that June is almost over already. And, you know, Pam and I, we almost didn't go on the air on time because Pam and I were sitting here chatting away uh, about all kinds of stuff as we move into our first full week of summer. And, of course, I started off the summer solstice with one of the greatest events of my life, and that is doing a Q&A with the one and only Buzz Aldrin. Uh, so just sit down one-on-one -on -one interview with him, which you're going to get to hear momentarily. But a lot of great films are out, a lot of great indie films are out there right now. I've got to tell you about, I also want to tell you, we have writer-director Michael Grudner joining us shortly. He's going to talk about his first narrative feature. Uh, Michael is, he's been doing music videos for quite a, quite a long time. He also has a Dirty Laundry.tv podcast, um, which is amazing. So, but Michael's going to be joining us to talk about his film, The Icarus Line Must Die. Uh, punk music fans are going to recognize The Icarus Line and the co-writer and star, Joe Cardamone. So I'm looking forward to talking to Michael because this is really, I didn't know what to expect when I saw the film, shot in black and white, a true black and white. It looks absolutely beautiful. Some of the visual in-camera effects are absolutely gorgeous. Um, but it, it's actually a wonderfully introspective look at guys trying to make it in the music industry. So, can't wait to talk to Michael. But before Michael, I'm going to let you hear a little bit about my interview with Buzz Aldrin. This past week, when I got to moderate a Q&A with Buzz, in addition to sitting down with him, uh, it was in relation to a documentary, The Man Who Unlocked the Universe. Uh, it is out of Uzbekistan. Uh, a wonderful team of filmmakers put this together, uh, a documentary with recreations about Uleg Beg. Um, astronomers will undoubtedly recognize the name of Uleg Beg. Um, Many, most people will not, but Ulig Beg was preceded Galileo by 150 years. Ulig Beg created the seminal, completed the seminal star tables for the charting of all the stars in the sky. He also calculated out the 23.5 degree tilt that the Earth has in its revolution around the sun. Um, he also created the world's largest observatory with a sextant where the dome part of the sextant is 40 meters uh, wide. And you can still go and see that in Uzbekistan, by the way. And uh, after seeing the documentary, Uzbekistan is, it's, it's on my bucket list now. Um, but Uleg Beg, fascinating, fascinating man who dreamt of the stars, who looked to the stars. And finally, he's getting a lot of recognition, not only in Uzbekistan, but more and more people around the world are starting to learn about Uleg Beg. And because of the fact summer solstice made the perfect time for the premiere of this, of this doc, and it's not long. It's 38 minutes long, and every, you can get it on Amazon Streaming right now. Um, and I, I encourage you, I highly encourage you. It's, it's a wonderful little documentary. Um, a lot of recreations in it, visual recreations. Armand Asante plays Uleg Beg. Um, and we go through, and Vincent Cassell narrates, and we go through his life, um, how he became interested in the stars and in study and education and intellect. And it was due to the connection with his grandfather. You know, everything has a connection to the past. Um but who better to get involved and help host and, and initiate this documentary into the world than Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon. 
Um, Buzz has been probably the most visible face of part of the space industry for decades. Uh, even after retiring as an astronaut, he is our global space ambassador, for lack of a better description, and is championing our trip to Mars. Um, he makes appear He's in his 80s now. He still makes appearances all over. He's working with the California Science Center for something coming up this July. Of course, um, there is also next year's the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, and he will be involved with that with a big to-do uh, with NASA commemorating that. But Buzz also has a new project, Human Space Flight Institute, that will be a think tank. So needless to say, not really talking about the film, per se, the documentary per se, but Buzz talking about Human Space Flight in, uh, Institute. Also ask him about the Cycler. The Cycler is something that he designed, a spaceship that, and it's going to be instrumental in getting us to Mars. And one of Buzz's big things is reusability. We recycle on Earth, let's recycle with space. Um, but of course... You know, looking back on this documentary of Ulig Beg, you know, he had some very thoughtful things to say in terms of his own life and his past and where the future is. So we get a little geeky. We get science geeky here. I admit it. I always do when I talk with Buzz. But I hope you'll enjoy it. I know a very dear friend who worked with my dad for many years, David Scott Nichols. I know David is going to love this. So take a listen, Buzz Aldrin. Trying to gin up the <clears throat> California Science Center for a, a preamble of the Space Week. So I'm trying to help them develop uh, uh, July 16th, because I'll be here mm -hmm. that weekend. Uh, it's a Monday, and... Uh, so they can meld in, I think, uh, AIAA. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm afraid that they think I'm imposing something, and I'm, I'm trying to make it a positive for Everything. L.A., San Diego, Seattle. I know it'll be a positive mm -hmm. on the 20th of July this year for Houston because mm -hmm. I'm beginning to develop some things there. You're doing the Human Space Flight Institute in Houston. Yes, yes, yes. I Tell me about that, Buzz. I'm so excited to hear about that. It it has come together in, in a way of uh, bringing together assets and then uh, what for? Well, to come up with things or to evaluate. Now, if you just uh, get a lot of academia and uh, query and say, I want, I want a lot of new ideas, mm -hmm. um, I, I think it should be the other way. There will be, uh, coming from somewhere, the description of innovation mm -hmm. because it's absent. It isn't being developed and, and a number of people think it should be. Mm -hmm. So it's to fill a gap of what the existing way mm -hmm. <clears throat> has come up with mm -hmm. and how it has been, uh, uh, been sort of governed mm -hmm. uh, by natural uh, natural competitive opportunities and uh, returns mm -hmm. uh, coupled with uh, 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 with the flow through uh, Congress. Mm -hmm. And it's that combination. Uh, uh, doing a little research, I, I had somebody uh, <clears throat> help me by informing me that um, President Eisenhower's farewell address, mm -hmm. cautioning the public about the military-industrial complex, mm -hmm. was originally the military-industrial-congressional complex. Mm -hmm. But guess who removed the word congressional? Uh. Politicians. <laughs> oh. So, uh, 
had they left that in, I think uh, things might have evolved a little differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because now it is so obvious to me that that in uh, space it's an industry of aerospace. And, uh, and the influence uh, that they have, not just by selling their wares to, uh, to an entity in the government, but it, it works its way through the, uh, uh, the funding cycles mm -hmm. and the power that has evolved from those three equal branches of the government right. that uh, the founding fathers thought were kind of equal. Mm -hmm. And now every uh, every agency in the executive branch gets approved by the Congress, by the Senate, and all the judges get approved by the Senate, and the funding comes out of the Congress. Yeah, something something of this separate but equal kind of <laughs> got a little bit lost in there. And and uh, uh, yeah, I. I've listened and talked to term limits people, and no way that's going to do it. The reaction and right. the capability of mm. finding out how to do uh, what what is in your best interest mm -hmm. can be done so quickly. <laughs> you know, I'm curious, Buzz, because I know the Cycler spacecraft, that has been a passion of yours for a long time. And I know that's one of your visions for how you see us getting to Mars is through the cycler. I'm curious, do you think we're still on track? Because a couple of years ago you had said that you thought that by 2019 we might have a craft go, by 2021 maybe a man craft, maybe by 2024 a flyby of Venus. I'm curious what how you think we are on track for getting to Mars. Well, but do you see us still on track for what you had hoped? Well, see, we, we leaped into journey to Mars. Mm-hmm. And I think without fully understanding just how we would be departing Earth to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think because of needing a mission for a big rocket coupled with what can it do, the... Uh, uh, the refueling was selected close to where the fuel is, mm -hmm. not on the surface of the moon, but in orbit. Mm -hmm. Well, that is not the best place. To, let me just describe. The moon goes around 27 and a half days. Mm -hmm. The direction to go to Mars is fairly fixed during the brief launch window. What tells you that that's going to be in the right place? Because you're not going to just go from there. Mm -hmm. Everyone, I think without exception, you're going to swing by the Earth where the velocity is high. Mm -hmm. You're going to have the velocity there, and off you go. Mm -hmm. um, but it takes Earth fuel less efficient to get all everything out there. Right. So why go out there? Why not stay down where the velocity is a little higher mm -hmm. than use lunar fuel to mm -hmm. build up to that same velocity? <clears throat> now, you, you can use the expression of uh, wasting, uh, getting up there by Earth fuel, uh, but the astrodynamics people will say uh, to get the most out of uh, an addition of... Uh, energy, you do it when the velocity is, is high. Mm -hmm. So when is the velocity high? Down in Earth orbit. Don't, don't go way out and come back unless you need a mission for a big rocket mm -hmm. like the SLS. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that explains why asteroid redirect go out and bring a rock back. Mm -hmm. That's a mission for a big rocket. Yes. And that didn't saying. work out. <laughs> Can you imagine? Because uh, I looked into this. Uh, if you send a robot out to a, an asteroid, mm -hmm. you got to communicate 
to it with 15, 30 second time delay. Nah, pretty sloppy. Right. And you put something on it and it stays on it. Mm -hmm. uh, you send a human mission out and uh, you got to bring them back so they can only stay there for a short while. When they get there, to use the human, you got to depressurize and he's out there EVA mm -hmm. with whatever he carries along with him. Right. That's very limited. Mm -hmm. So both of them are limited. But why don't you put both of them together the same time period? Mm -hmm. That works. Well, I'll tell you why it doesn't. Because the robotic people and the human spaceflight people compete for funds. So they don't talk to each other. <laughs> I mean, how else? So I've been trying to push for, and we did, and made a lot of uh, trajectory runs with a mm -hmm. uh, young uh, Disciples are very talented in doing this. He's working on a PhD. Uh, and uh, so we did quite a few where the crew gets there. Two days after they're there, the robot gets there that's been flying very fuels for a year and a half or so, mm -hmm. saving fuel. Well, the crew has two guys that know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Another one knows everything about asteroids, especially the one they're looking at. Mm -hmm. Now, the other seat is a robotic engineer. He designed, built, and saw launched mm -hmm. the robot that they're looking at for 60 days. Now, in the same time period, you got these two. Why in the world wouldn't you want to do that? <laughs> I think I'm going to have to go to Luxembourg and sell it. <laughs> Because that's where they're financing people. Really? And now we've canceled the asteroid redirect, right? And all the effort that went into that is now down the drain. And well, yeah, but I'd like to keep the keep. parts of it alive. Yeah. But that's not the game plan. Uh, a lot of some things are too come along too late. And that was just part, part of my interview with Buzz Aldrin. And the rest of it you'll be able to hear tomorrow on BehindTheLensOnline.net. So check it out then. But right now, we are going, well, unless we have time later today, and then maybe Pam will, will play the rest of it for us. But right now. I am thrilled to be welcoming Michael Grudner, right, co-writer and director of The Icarus Line Must Die. Welcome, Michael. Hello, how are you? Well, I am thrilled to be speaking with you. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good, pretty good. So how, how did The Icarus Line Must Die do uh, over the weekend? It was opening weekend. You had your premiere last... You, you didn't hear about it? <clears throat> I did not. It it uh, it it t it went head to head with uh, Jurassic World, and I, I think I think we uh, we squashed them. You know, as well you should. But for Blue, the di <laughs> but for Blue, I mean, I gotta I, I gotta give it up. You know, my heart belongs to Blue in Jurassic World, our favorite raptor. But yeah, Icarus, you know, Icarus has a, has a progeny, so you know, I think that's very appropriate. Um, yes. Uh, you know, I have to say, two very different films, both of which I like. What I love, though, about The Icarus Line Must Die is it's unexpected, it's realism, it's grit, and it's beautiful, exquisite black and white cinematography. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, from a technical standpoint, I am just mesmerized by The Icarus Line Must Die. What you and your cinematographer, Jacob Mendel, did, absolutely outstanding. Um, That's very nice. Thank you. I mean, this, this is the beauty of independent films, when you really get to see somebody push the envelope with what I like to call, you know, low-budget, no-budgets. Because I think that really brings out the creativity, and the visual creativity really rivals the musical excellence of Joe Cardamon. 
That's great. Where where did this story of the Icarus line must die come from? I know you co-wrote it with Joe, who was front front man for the Icarus line, a very well known punk right. band in the in the early two thousands. Yes, I've known Joe for several years, and and we've always wanted to work together uh, in some capacity. Um, I do a lot of work uh, shooting with musicians, either music videos or interviews, and I even uh, host shows in Los Angeles, like indie and punk shows. Uh, so Joe and I have talked about working together, and it, it got, got to a point where um, I came up with this idea for making a film, uh, sort of a rock and roll film, a, a throwback in a sense, uh, I hadn't seen a good punk rock movie in years, and I've always loved movies like uh, Repo Man or Sid and Nancy, and I wanted to make a movie in that spirit in Los Angeles. And since Joe and I both have a lot of relationships with musicians, uh, sort of the underground L.A. music scene, um, it seemed like we could, we can pull this off and and make a film with some great, characters and great musical performances in it uh and uh that's that's how it came about and of course the story in and of itself i mean it's fascinating everybody has these great even of even of the punk rock world everybody has this great idea that it's glitz it's glamour oh you got the flash bulbs going off uh, but what we really see here is a slice of life uh in the world of joe in this fictional world um as and fellow musicians as they deal with making ends meet as selling you know equipment in order to have rent money um selling out uh having to produce music that you don't really like in order to pay the bills um it's really and then just casual two guys hanging out um, that I, I have to say, I got to kind of equate it to what the internet sensation right now of James Corden and Paul McCartney going around Liverpool. Um, right. but, but I mean, that's the feel that you get. It's just, these are everyday people just like us. They just happen to be talented and their vocation happens to be music, but they're very relatable. You know, punk rock is not that far. It's not removed from the rest of us. And I love that relatability that, uh, you guys bring to life here. Great. No, I'm happy uh, it came across that way for you. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was an interesting point in, in Joe's career and Joe's life. You know, he had this initial success with the Icarus line when he was in his early 20s and, and all the, the trappings of success, but also all the, just the, the, the you know, kind of tumultuous crazy you know just that 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 crazy touring stuff that goes on when you're in a punk band in your early 20s now you flash forward to like 15 years later and joe's about to turn 36 or he's 36 years old he's about to get married he's got a house he's got to put food on the table um it's an interesting time in someone's life and i do think it's relatable to a lot of people especially artists mm -hmm. um who are forced with that 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 struggle between art and commerce and how do you how do you maintain your integrity and how do you keep going and doing you know the art that you think is is great while still uh you know putting food on your table and maintaining your relationships uh with people and and being like a you know a normal uh functioning person in society mm -hmm. Well, and, and you guys take it a step further because in the script you've got this great subplot going on where Joe is receiving death threat text messages and then he has dreams. And the w the dreams are, are lensed so exquisitely. You have some beautiful blowouts in there, just gorgeous, and some great effects that I think you were doing in camera, but I'm not sure, I and I want to get to that. But the metaphor for where he is at his point in life where this is taking place. It's, you know, it, it can be taken so many ways, but that metaphor is so strong and so dynamic, yet so beautifully displayed. I, that, that, I think, uh, 
is one of the finest elements of the film. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, believe it or not, these, um, these death threats uh, that he was receiving, this is all based in fact. Wow. Uh, Joe went through a period of time where he was receiving death threats via text. In fact, the texts that we have in the film are literally word for word the texts that he was receiving at oh the time. Oh, my God. And they were anonymous, and it, it was uh, a, a cause for great anxiety for Joe. And he, he had these nightmares, and it was, it was kind of paralyzing for him. So, um, you know, it, it certainly was very close to the bone for Joe, especially scoring those uh, nightmare scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, this, you know, this really meant a lot to him, and he wanted to uh, portray this as close to uh, how he experienced it as possible. You know, I'm curious, and you may not know the answer to this, but this had to have been cathartic to at least some degree for Joe in putting this on paper and having this unfold on film uh perhaps uh that you certainly would have to ask him um you know he, he on 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 another uh level you know joe joe is a musician joe has this persona that he that he has uh, you know in the pu a public persona mm -hmm. in a sense and you know and and in the film he displays a lot of vulnerability uh which perhaps you're not used to seeing from him or a, you know, what you would expect from a front man of a, you know, punk band or a kind of post hardcore band. So uh, it's kind of interesting, but yeah, that's definitely a question you did have to ask him is whether it was cathartic for him. Well, you know, and you mentioned poignancy and I have to say that one of the most poignant sequences in the film is Joe and hanging out with Alvin de Guzman fishing um, and it, while Alvin was undergoing chemotherapy, and he has since left us, so to see this included in the film, it really, it humanizes everyone, and and I'm so glad you included that. Yeah, um, well, uh, Alvin was a uh, a childhood friend of Joe's. They they been together in as friends but also in in the Icarus line and in bands since I believe in their high school days uh Alvin was always the kind of the moral center of the band and and Joe relied on him for that um and uh it was important for Alvin to be in the film but these scenes have obviously take on a uh extra poignancy given that Alvin passed away, I believe in, I think it was in October, yeah. uh, he did get to see the film. And, um, yeah, yeah, we're all, uh, you know, it's, you, you kind of watch those scenes with kind of a lump in your throat when you, uh, you know, knowing, uh, knowing that he's passed. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got to ask you about making this leap into a feature film from music videos. Um, uh, what was that learning curve like for you? And did you change your approach in how you were going to direct and, uh, and develop your visual tonal bandwidth as opposed to what you do with a music video? Uh, it, you know, it's sort of one of these things where you've been planning for this or, or, or uh, training for this your whole life. So... It seemed to be a natural progression from music videos, and, and a lot of my music videos are narrative videos, mm -hmm. uh, so I like to tell a story within the video. Uh, but I would say the biggest difference for me is ma making this film uh, on my and, and it and it's purely. I mean, one one reason for it is, is you know, budgetary wise, um, this this movie was made without any storyboarding. I usually storyboard all my music videos and, um, and I'm very, I come to the set knowing exactly what I'm going to shoot. Uh, in this particular film, because it was made on a, on a very limited budget, mm -hmm. we would show up on a set or in a location perhaps that I hadn't seen before that until that day. So we just, you know, I just had to figure it out on the fly. 
And it was it was outside of my comfort zone, but I loved it. I loved the experience of doing that. Um, so it was, it was, in a way, there was a lot of surprises for me when I showed up on the day of the set. Well, um, that begs two two questions at the front of my mind. Then, Michael, is that going to locations you hadn't even seen? Number one, what kind of cameras were you using? And number two. How did that impact whether you were going to use sticks, whether you're going to do steady cam, whether you're just going to do run and gun handheld? It, you know, how did that play into the development of what you ended up doing on the day? Yeah, we shot uh, with um, we shot with five Ds, Canon five Ds, and we used vintage lenses, which uh, helped helped the look a great deal. Um, as far as as far as whether we were on sticks. Or we're doing handheld. Um, I think we. we I, I certainly had an aesthetic approach going in. I knew exactly what type of a style of, of film I wanted to make. Uh, so that lent, that dictated whether we were on sticks or handheld. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it, there's there's a good mix of of you know, traditional mise en scène, if you will. Mm-hmm. And and then handheld, uh, almost cinema verite. Mm-hmm. Uh, we kind of mix it up, but but that was a very conscious, planned approach going in. Mm-hmm. Now I have to say, uh, the concert uh, the concert sequence in your third act near the end is just incredible. Uh, you know, I just I think that is absolutely gorgeous in black and white. You know, were you shooting? Were you shooting the performance pieces with just two cameras as well, or did you throw a few more in the mix? We had three cameras there for that particular uh, performance, uh, and so we had a camera right at the front of the stage that pretty much focused on Joe. Mm-hmm. We had one camera on stage that we were roaming around on stage while the performance was going on, and then we had a camera sort of in the back that was our master. But um, yeah, I love I love shooting performance footage, and I love editing performance footage, and uh, you know, try to put everything we could possibly, every experience I've had shooting performance into that. Mm-hmm. Well, because you didn't storyboard this and you did jump out of your comfort zone there, I'm curious how well you stuck to your script. In terms, and then in terms of how much footage you ended up with to head into the editing bay with. Uh, well, the movie we used. What we did is we used a detailed outline mm-hmm. to shoot from. So much of the film is is improvised, but we the the outline was structured in a, as a screenplay, as a story, as a three in, in three act structure. Uh, so you know, I knew everything that I wanted to achieve in each scene. Uh, many of these performers, in fact, I would say, I almost want to say 100%, they, weren't, they aren't necessarily improv actors by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, they, you know, I think, I think they did a great job. They really, I mean, I think it lent a lot of authenticity to the film, mm-hmm. the fact that they weren't actors. Um, but we did shoot a lot. We did, we, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's chunks of these scenes, conversations that went on that, uh, that we didn't use because it didn't, it didn't fit within the storyline of what we were trying to uh, achieve. Uh, so, yeah, there's, we shot a lot of footage. <laughs> um, but, but that said, there were only a few scenes in the, in the outline that didn't make it into the final cut. Oh, well, might we be seeing them at a later date on a DVD? That's definitely a possibility. Because, you know, as I, as I watch this film and everything you have on screen, it is, you know, it's so compelling to watch. You know, as I said, number one, for the purity of the black and white uh, that you had, the palette that you have. But, you know, just the casual nature um, Joe just talking, hanging out, talking to people. It's just, it's just welcoming. It, it feels, it's very affable even. And you just want to sit there and you just want to listen. Um, 
so I would love to see some of those scenes, you know, included, you know, and pop up on a DVD sometime at some point. Right. Well, you just might. <laughs> you just might see some. So where do you, because I know another big part of your life is also Dirty Laundry TV. Right. How, you know, how are you balancing everything? You've done, you've done music videos. You've got Dirty Laundry TV. You're now jumping into, you know, feature film work now. Where do you see yourself going? How does all of this meld together to create Michael? Well, I, I, I think everybody, oh, I, a lot of people that I work with, I think the end, the end goal is always features and making movies. Uh, it's weird in a sense that these days, uh, I, mean, I guess television it kind of might be on the same par as that, as mm-hmm. far as the end goal. Uh, but for me, it's always been features. So um, when we're making music videos in the back of our heads, we're, we're making these to someday hopefully make a feature. Um, but... But by the same token, Dirty Laundry, uh, Dirty Laundry TV, which is a web series that I created about 10 years ago, we interview bands in a laundromat while they do their laundry. <laughs> that was always um, something I put together because I wanted to stay in touch with the music scene while I was concentrating on making films. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was sort of a low-impact way of just staying in touch with you know, the music community. And uh, it kind of had taken on a life of itself. And dirty and and the Icarus line must die was sort of a natural outgrowth of Dirty Laundry TV. Mm-hmm. So we and we had interviewed Joe from the uh, Icarus line twice on the show, and that's how I eventually met him. We interviewed Keith Morris. We interviewed Ariel Pink. Uh, so these are people I did not know before doing that. It's always who you know, not what you know. Sure. Yeah, and in, in a way, I think it's a mix of, of everything. It's sort of, you can't plan these things. I mean, they're certainly not planned as far as, um, you know, we're going to get to know Keith so that we could then cast him in a movie. It just seemed to work out that mm-hmm. way. Do you see yourself actually stepping into a full-on narrative with a structured script? Um, and, in, in, and if so, in, it, in any particular genre? Yeah, I, I am... You know, I, I eventually, I, I started off in Los Angeles. I went to film school at USC, and ri- writing was was one of the major uh, major elements of my education there. So I've written several scripts, and uh, I have two projects in particular that are narrative scripts that I've written that I'm looking to hopefully will be the second and third films that I, uh, that I make. Uh, one is called Beyond Apollo, which is based on a uh, cult classic science fiction novel. And another is called We Are Here, which is a more a horror picture. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, now you've piqued my curiosity with both of them. I need, cool. I, I need to see these made, Michael. <laughs> yes. Okay. Me too. So let me ask you, where can everybody... Now that the Icarus line must die is out there, it is out in the world. Where can people find it? Uh, well, we are currently at the Royal Theater in West LA. That's one one five two three Santa Monica Boulevard. Mm-hmm. We're playing at nine fifty five for the rest of the week. I think for Thursday nights to last night. Um, Then we'll be spreading across the country uh, in a limited release. I think we'll be in New York uh, in another week or so. Um, And then on July 10th, we're going to Video On Demand and iTunes and Amazon and and various streaming services. So within the next 14 days, everybody will be able to see this. No one will have an excuse not to. Exactly. Exactly. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. Michael, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure Absolutely. speaking with you today. Yeah, thank you so much, too. I mean, I real, as I said, you know, I just the minute I, I started watching the film with the purity of the black and white, 
which, you know, as I said, Jacob just did. And, of course, Canon just delivers so beautifully um, uh, with their with the imagery. But the black and white is so haunting, so elegant, classic, and timeless. And it just sucked me right in. And then Joe's story took over. Oh, that's o- great to hear. And Joe's story took over from Thank there. You. So, yeah, I really encourage people, you know, when people have an idea and perception of, of punk rock, this is something totally different, and it is it is something everyone can relate to on one level or another. Job well done, Michael. I, I want to see more from you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, we'll definitely be in touch. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know how it's going. Please do, and I'd love to have you back on the show again. I would love to come. Thanks so much, Michael. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye-bye. Thanks. And that was Michael Grudner, co-writer and director of The Icarus Line Must Die. Um, and as he said, it's playing at the Royal in West L.A. right now. It goes into New York uh, next week or the week after, but by July 10th, it'll be on all the digital platforms, VOD, iTunes, so you can find it there. Well worth a watch, folks. Really well worth a watch. And filmmakers will really appreciate the visual the visual tone and the visual work of the film. So, what do you think, Pam? Should we take uh should we take a short break or should we jump into the Zellner brothers? Well, we're gonna jump into the Zellner brothers. Um, They have a new film that just came out this weekend that is hilarious. In a word, it is a wild, wacky, and wonderful Western. It is a revisionist kind of Western. Think of uh, Bud Boddicker back in the 40s, films like his, Wings of the Hawk, Comanche Station. Um, They have done a revisionist twist, the film Damsel Stars, uh, Robert Pattinson, Mia Wasikowska, uh, a wonderful short appearance by uh, legendary Robert Forrester. And then David and Nathan Zellner also are in the cast and star in the film. And it is a journey of Robert Pattinson's character named Samuel, who is allegedly heading off to find the love of his life and marry her. But things are not what they seem. And he is not what he seems. And the Zellners create this mythic sense of this mythic concept of the Old West. They open the film with Pattinson's character, Samuel, riding through the fog in a rowboat with a miniature horse and landing on on the shore. It looks like something out of Miss of Avalon. Uh, But that's just where the fun starts with this film. Uh, It is in limited release right now. You definitely need to see it. Uh, it's good for a laugh. There's a lot of great uh, great humor in it. But here again, thanks to Adam Stone, cinematographer, who's known for working on Jeff Nichols' films like uh, Midnight Special, Compliance, Take Shelter, Loving. Uh, he's teamed up with the Zellners here. And I'd say 95% of the film is shot on location. Uh in the beautiful, up in the Utah area, forest hills, vistas, the panoramic views are gorgeous. So take a listen to our exclusive interview with David and Nathan Zellner talking damsel. I have to tell you, I laughed my ass off watching this film. It is a wild, wacky, wonderful Western. This With this revisionist take, I am in love with this film. Oh, thank you. oh, thanks so much. You guys just knocked it out of the park with unconvention- unconventionality uh, in the storytelling. You're constantly shifting POV, which makes it so engaging. You bring in Adam Stone as your DP, and you've got the glorious outdoors, and you really celebrate it and punctuate with color. There is nothing I do not like about this film. <laughs> oh, thanks so much. That's what, that's what we strive for in it. So the things we like about it. <laughs> yeah, and I particularly love the revisionist spin on the Western. I'm a huge Western fan, and 
I see little touches of uh, a Bud Boddicker touch oh, in wow. here. Oh, yeah, he's, a, he's a, one of our all-time heroes. Uh, I think he's, uh, he's incredible, and I, I think he, he doesn't, I don't know, I think not enough people know about him, because I think, he, and, which is to me, because he's had such a, an impact on on uh, on so many filmmakers that, that followed him, and, um, and I also think just it, it, his films are so fascinating in a way, on the surface, they could seem more conventional and, and, um, and, and, um, and, and more like lighthearted, you know, uh, wholesome kind of fare. Mm-hmm. And then they have, with those amazing scripts, there's this underlying uh, uh, darkness that, is, 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 that, that, that makes it feel like a, 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 the more of the, a, the, the real complex world. Um, and, uh, and and I, I find them endlessly fascinating. And that's exactly what you guys have done with the script for Damsel, because it's it has light and fluffy, for lack of a better term at the moment, light and fluffy exterior, but underneath, you're really dealing with some interesting, darker themes, and just interesting themes in general. Uh, Mia's whole character of Penelope is just... Hello, timeliness couldn't be more timely with the strong independent <laughs> with the strong independent woman and female empowerment. You bring in a discussion on Native Americans. You've got the character of Samuel as Robert plays him, and as you wrote him, it is just we see lies unfolding, we see charms, we see con men, we see the psychological horrors of of obsessive compulsiveness. Um, Fabulous, and then we see the shyness of uh, and the insecurity of somebody like Parson Henry, who just wants to love and be loved. And you cover all of these things so beautifully and seamlessly that as you're watching, you don't real really realize the depth of your story, and that is just brilliant for a storyteller. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's all. That's incredibly sweet. We appreciate all that. I mean, that's 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 that's, that's exactly you know that's that's what we that's what we strive for with this, and we like the idea of things working. In in that we spent a lot of time with the script um, uh, before making it, and and we like the idea of things working on different levels, um, and we like uh, you know I, I, we want to make the kinds of things that we would want to see ourselves, and and there's nothing that we love more than a film that we that we can. Um, see more than once and kind of like appreciate in different ways you know and if you know and if this is if, if people like this that's on a very surface level at just once and that's fantastic you know and, and if they're just entertained you know that that's great because that's like the first and foremost what films are, are for <laughs> i guess but but it's nice when you know but we, we we try to have it work on different layers where there's there's more going on if you want it this is a very interesting follow-up to kamiko so i'm curious where the idea for this story came and how you went about developing the story with and not just the story as a whole but the nuances that you incorporate the quirkiness that you have you know we have a miniature horse and not a horse we got uh, you know a quote unquote cowboy or a capitalist coming into town in the fog in a rowboat with a box with a horse and then goes around with a chicken in a cage um, on the back of the horse (laughs) You leave no stone unturned with these little touches, but these are touches that don't come up in production design. These are written into the script. So I'm very curious, with your fertile minds, where this story came from and the development of the minutia and the detail that makes Damsel what it is. Well, that's a great question. I mean, from the, you know, things always evolve as you make it, and, 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 and when you're making all, you know, you have a great team that brings different things to the table, but at the same time, we, we, we stick very closely to the script, and we're very visually oriented with the script in terms of the details, uh, partly just because that's the way we think, and then also it just makes the job easier in ter- when you're, you know, when you're making the film in terms of, you know, conveying what, what you want. But, I mean, I, I, it starts from... I, I, I think the, the ideas, you know, ideas come from from different places. Sometimes it's it's uh, it's something with some more resonance and and um, uh, and logic behind it. Um, in, in terms of you know, like the I think that the 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 things that happen in the middle of the film were kind of the, the kernel of things, you know, mm-hmm. with the story, and that that just kept 
sitting for you know for a long time, and then um, and then and then you know and then you build ideas from there, um, and, and then then it's and it's a mix and a mix of things that you know you just you had trying to do things that you hadn't seen. We we're huge Western fans, but you, you just it wouldn't do anyone any good if we're just copying everything. That's right done before so it's kind of like but it comes all comes from a place of appreciation so it's kind of taking things that we like um and or, um and either doing a different like something different on it that would be more interesting for us personally or um or or the, the combination of things because it, i mean the, you know the western genre so it's much broader than i think it, you know a lot of people realize mm-hmm. that just in terms of they, they kind of group it all either you know it's like well it's like you know the the the, the john ford westerns or or the you know, the spaghetti westerns or thing and, it, and but those, there's there's so many you know there's so many areas in between with, with so many different facets that are um, really interesting and we, we love everything i mean the growing up we love the spaghetti westerns but and then then when we you know discovered Bennecker's work it really blew our minds but at the you know, same time we were heavily influenced by Looney Tunes and Yosemite Sam and, and then even like Little House on the Prairie, you know, so it's like it covers, it covers a, a wide spectrum of, of the things that we're influenced by. And then we're also, and then, and then along with that, we, we just, you know, grew up going on what is spending a lot of time outdoors and, and uh, especially in, 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 uh, in, in the West on road trips and that sorts of thing. So um, I, uh, I, I think it's just um, those sorts of things are, are a culmination of all that. And, um, and then we've never worked, we never, uh, we haven't seen a miniature horse in, in, in many Westerns, no. uh, except maybe the, the Terror of Tiny Town. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but that, <laughs> that was with, uh, with an all, all, all miniature horse <laughs> cast, basically. But um, we, you know, we just like the, the visual element of it, uh, or especially with like the chicken on, on, on the horse's back, those things just kind of pop in pop in your head and then and then sometimes you, you they just kind of hang out until you, you until it finds the logic of its own with, it, with the story. Well I have to say the one thing that that will stay in my head forever, probably my most favorite moment in the in the film is when Anton is peeing on on a log and gets shot in the back of the head, falls backward Lying flat, and his body is still peeing. Uh, that, uh, that was something we've never seen. I've I mean, never seen that anywhere. So yeah, we've never seen it before, and and that was that was one of the first things, first basis. <laughs> that was one of the first things uh, that, that popped up, you know, in, in 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 coming up with the story. It was just like it was just this this extreme visual, and it was very specific in that way. We knew it needed to be shown. I mean, that was incredibly detailed in the script. We knew it needed to look exactly like that. It didn't, um, also, just because people, I feel like in films, especially with like male nudity, they, it's like they, there's lots of, you know, you can you suddenly pulled out of the film when it's edited around, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, whereas with, when there's when there's female nudity, it's, it's much more liberal in in incorporating it. So we just wanted to treat it very matter of fact, as if you know you're looking at an animal or anything else, and 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 um, and just you know make it just allow it to be part of the scene as it's meant to be. Oh well, that is my my favorite ultimate scene in this film because I have never seen anything like it, and I just I was <laughs> laughing scary. so hard I had tears running down my face. Uh, <laughs> You know, I've, I've got to ask you guys, it's always very challenging whenever you're on location out in in locations such as you were um, with woods, and you're at the mercy of Mother Nature for so much of the film, and you've got, what, 95% of the film is all outdoors. Yeah. So what kind of challenges did the two of you and your DP, Adam Stone, what did you have in combating the weather? You know, animals that just wander around. You know, things like poison ivy, Mother Nature on the whole. But also, while you're also capturing these beautiful vistas, the gorgeous heightened colors of a smog-free sky and the greens of the trees and, you know, the, the clarity of water. I mean, just absolutely stunning. But having worked second unit... Uh, in the past and knowing a lot of the old western stuntmen who did the westerns in the 40s 50s and 60s i know the challenges of this kind of exterior shoot so i'm curious how you guys handled this i mean that's i mean that's part of the excitement of filmmaking for us is is these sorts of challenges and and knowing that it's all worth it um at the end because of of these unique locations and, and and being on uh, you know, out there as opposed to, you know, recreating it with a lot of computers or, or something like that. But uh, it definitely, you know, you set yourself up for it and you try to learn as much and talk to other people who've, who've done these sort of productions. 
connections and hire people who have that sort of experience. And we got, you know, really lucky with the animals and we uh, felt pretty well prepared for the elements and only had a couple of, of bad weather days, but you, you kind of roll with it. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of it is just like you're out there in the elements and you, you sort of take what it gives you, you know, if it's adapt, yeah, and adapt to it. And, 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 and you're, you're out there to record nature. And, and, and if, if, it, if an animal happens to, uh, you know, walk through your set or there's too many bugs, it's this, it's this part of what living out there would have been like. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I mean, like every other aspect of filmmaking, it's all about just adapting, you know, and, and, uh, and sometimes it works in your favor and sometimes you have to find creative solutions. But, um, yeah, that was, I mean, it's, that, that's, we, we like, we like the idea of shooting on location. We, you know, with not, uh, we, you know, um, uh, without, without augmenting things digitally or anything, you know, we, we, we wanted it to all be, there's all, you know, all the, all the, the effects and everything are all, all practical. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was, that was part of, uh, what was fun about it for us. Well, another part of this film that, that sets it apart from, the Western genre as a whole is Scott uh, Cusio's production design. I've got to tell you, the town itself, number one, there's some great tongue-in-cheek stuff with, you know, the names on the stores and the buildings, but you bring in some color. We never, but for, I think, Miss Kitty's, you know, red saloon dress uh, on Gunsmoke, we never really get to see these old dusty western towns with any kind of color in them and you and scott you developed this so that you got like a pale like dusty rose on some of the exteriors or some blues so i'm curious as to your thoughts on injecting some color in a non-traditional fashion here that was important for us uh for, yeah, from the outset we didn't want it to be you know, like a lot of like a sepia western you know where where uh, where everyone is wearing like brown clothes, and then you're shooting in the desert, you know, and mm-hmm. that's, that's I feel that's um, you know that's that's the, the, you know the case with a lot of films, and so it was fun for us, um, you know, to, to to infuse color to. I think I think because of black and white photography, it kind of wired people's brains to just think that that that's 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 how it was. But I mean, in reality, you know, they, fashion was just as important then as it is. Uh, as it is now, uh, as just much a thing, and um, and we like the idea, and it just you know, and it was, so it was more interesting to us to you know that, to infuse it with color, uh, and so be- between the, the production designer Scott Cusio and and the costume designer uh, Terry Anderson and the cinematographer Adam Stone, we, that was something yeah from from the outset we we really wanted to to you know in, in, embrace that and, and give it a, a, a real vibrancy. Mm. Before I let you go, I, I have to say your performances, respective performances in the film, are great. No offense to you, Nathan, but I'm particularly fond of David's take on Parson Henry. You know, fo- following up, fo- you know, after stealing the clothes from the beloved Robert, For- Robert Forster and, you know, taking over the role. Uh, I'm curious, um, obviously when you're performing on screen one of the for the bulk of it the other one is behind the camera directing so i want to ask you how do well do each of you take direction from the other one uh well we've done it so long you know if this is the first time we had operated in this way it would have been more daunting but we've always you know since we were kids making our movies it was always like you know people in front and behind you know where we're like wearing multiple hats and then i think you know we with uh, we, we act in a lot of our stuff, and, um, and and this was on a bigger scale. But we 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 write, you know, we wrote with these parts in mind, and and write to our strengths. And so, uh, and we've been lived with these roles, you know, for so long, long, but you know, before we cast it or made it, so that we have uh, between the two of us, we've kind of worked out all the kinks. You know, performance-wise, as, as much as you can prior, you know, um, so that um, we, when we're on set, the focus is on the the, the stars in terms of where, where the attention goes and, and, and time, um, and, and you know, in, in, in getting the, the performances. So um, I think that we, and I, just having done it so long, also we're able to kind of like shift gears in and out of, uh, of you know, of, of directing and acting mode. Um, 
and and um, it just I don't know it's like it's something we it just it just kind of takes a life of its own and it's not until we you know do interviews that we like think about like the the logistics of it but I just it's it's uh, you know you do it long enough and you you kind of you, you form patterns of, of how to make it function and then and then thankfully with the technology of the remote monitors you know mm-hmm. it uh, that you can like bring over you know to, to me when I'm in front of camera and vice versa it makes uh, it, it makes our lives a lot easier. <laughs> And that was David and Nathan Zellner talking a damsel. And yes, midway through there, yes, that is what it sounds like when somebody decides to start grinding on pipes when you're in the middle of an interview. Um, But that is all the time we have today. Uh, Remember, you will be able to hear the rest of the exclusive Buzz Aldrin interview on BehindTheLensOnline.net tomorrow. Next week, we have eight-time Mr. Olympia. Ronnie Coleman joins us to talk about his new docu- his, his documentary, Ronnie Coleman the King. And later in July, Fran Kranz is back. Always a joy to have Fran. And with him is going to be Casey Mott. And they're going to be talking A Midsummer Night's Dream, which now has distribution. So, until next week, I'm Debbie Elias. This is Behind the Lens.